Our final speaker is Mr. Jerry White. He is an American political militant, and he is also the co-founder of Survival Corp. He is uh, a well-known member of the International Campaign for the uh, Abolishing of Landmines, and he has also uh, uh, received the Nobel Peace Prize as such. In April 2012, uh, he was uh, uh, elected in the conflict section of the United States Department of State. You have the floor. Buongiorno, grazie. Hosting such a lively discussion. Um, when one speaks last, of course, it's a challenge because so much fullness of discussion and some completeness is already among us. A lot of wisdom and knowledge in this room. So I guess I would press my remarks um, uh, as a challenge given the urgency of the death and destruction around us. What are you going to do? What are we going to do? What must we do? So it reminds me when I, years ago, was gathered with a lot of Nobel laureates in Oslo to discuss peace. And so, of course, you had the Dalai Lama and Eli Wiesel and Lech Valenza and many Oscar Arias and many people who had won Nobel Prizes over the years. And it struck me in those three days of having a retreat outside of Oslo in a lovely inn that people quite didn't know what peace was. The Nobel laureates debated. Some got agitated. Others, the scholars who were among us, started to analyze what it was, what the science said, what we could learn from history. Again, not a lot of agreement. Because when you get to issues of violence, you get to the mystery as we're hearing, looking into the scriptures, looking into our past, looking into the mirror to say, why, how can we do this to each other? So getting beyond debate, we have to look at what shall we then do? We have some agreement here, of course, that creation is good. There's a dignity in difference. And we must respect and protect those rights to be different. Differently abled, differently believed, or non-believed. We all seem to agree there's a serious problem, and it's not quite like the past, but it's evoking the ghosts of totalitarianism, of violence, of fascism, of religious war. So is this religious violence, or when is violence truly religious? Or when is religion added as a kerosene to the fire, or as a match intentionally? We seem to agree that there is ignorance among us, between us. We have not studied enough. We don't know our scriptures and our faiths and our history. And sadly, tragically, we don't know each other. How can you love your neighbor if you don't know your neighbor, if there's no relationship and no possibility? So then we have questions of diagnosis and treatment. What is this sickness really of the soul? Well, we could bring in more scientists. Many say that actually violence is like an epidemic and behaves like a virus and can spread. So how does one interrupt it? How are we on the front line to be antibodies against violence? religious or otherwise. So what phase is the cancer we're looking at? What type or combination of cancers and sickness are we diagnosing? Do we have the diagnosis right? What we do see is actually religious violence, quote unquote, many will debate whether there is such a thing, violence that's related to religion or done in the name of religion is growing as a social hostility faster than other types of violence. It's this intercommunal or intracommunal hostility and hatred that is growing fastest and is manifesting faster in the Middle East and North Africa, although it is showing up all over the world. 
So what do we do? What's our change in thought or change in behavior? I often ask now that I'm a policymaker and I've been working in the Obama administration for three years now, what is the platform to make change in policy happen? And not just a negative strategy that we all dislike violence and hatred and killing, but what's an affirmative strategy? What is our call to action and to each other to make a difference, to save lives, many, many, many lives? So we have many, much experience in the past, and I would say that there are three levels that are emerging in what would be a call to action, a call for a global covenant, some are calling it, for interreligious peace. What is needed for peace and fullness? Where are we, as, as um, Rabbi Skorka was saying, where are we incomplete, where we do not have fullness and shalom or salam? So one area is among the religious leaders, many in this room as well. How well do you know each other? And what is the call to action that goes beyond and above nation states and borders and boundaries? So what would a global covenant or agreement look like to renounce violence in the name of religion, in the name of God? What type of parchment is needed for such a thing? What type of gathering to take the fullness of Santa Gidio's work as well and go even higher with the invitations of the Vatican and Pope Francis and many who are now asking for more. But that doesn't preclude the second tier, which we are familiar with, the nation state. The United Nations is also looking at what would a UN Security Council resolution look like to stop violence in the name of God to actually affirm what we have in common and what we can do? And how would one set up early warning and rapid response mechanisms to be able to mediate and negotiate these violent crises that we find ourselves in? What would that take? Jordan is taking a lead on some of that as well as the OIC and others, but the big question is, is there such a thing as religious side? Does one seek to eradicate religion, your sacred sites, your places of worship, your whole people? One of the questions that is percolating up and is controversial for us to look at from a legal as well as from a policy point of view is religious side. When is it genocide plus religion and the kerosene of invoking the name of God in belief and reward for such behavior? So the UN is trying to do its job, given the urgency of Iceland, what we're seeing around the world. But as you heard from Boko Haram all the way to the Rohingya to uh, the Middle East, everywhere we look, we're seeing headlines where religion is involved in a not nice way. And then there's the third tier. What is civil society doing on the front line? They've been working, helping survivors, helping um, mediation, seeking peace, all different techniques. But there has been no ingathering or body of knowledge looking at the best practice, the cumulative wisdom and knowledge and understanding of how one prevents mass violence and atrocity and promotes peace and resilience and how in fact religion can play a, a productive and constructive role in this. So three tiers, it's not that one will work, on its own. We can pray for peace, necessary but not sufficient. We can study for peace and dialogue for peace, necessary but not sufficient. Even in 1893 with the World Parliament of Religions and the ingathering that this was going to be a new day or now a repeated call for something like a UN or beyond UN body of religions that would study and work on this, this isn't quite a new idea, so the question is what would be different this time? And so I would pose that we must look at all of our roles in each of the categories simultaneously. We pray, we eat together, we get to know each other, we dialogue, but also move to places of emergency mediation as well as negotiation and then calling each layer, civil society, people on the front lines intercommunally, 
the UN and our states, the governments to protect human rights, as well as belief, the right and the freedom to believe, as well as practice. And then lastly, we as religious leaders, many of us wear more than one hat at the same time. So the challenge is, what are we doing next? What shall we do? And I would just close by saying, I think it will take an extraordinary daring and courage. That's what we're seeing. Things are moving quite quickly in the world in this viral spread of mass violence. What does one do to head off Ebola with machetes and guns? How does one stop the virus? This requires courage and action on each and every one of our parts. So as we go in the next couple of days in discussion, it will be lovely to have pragmatics and practical policy platforms and action add to our discussion of a very deep and ancient topic. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jerry White. All those who have spoken before you have posed the same question. We have to inquire where does violence come from? You have also posed something else. What can we do with violence? That has to, that is our common question today, and I would like to adhere to your proposal to change behaviors, not personally only. You propose a covenant, a world covenant, a global covenant to renounce violence in the name of religion. And you propose this at three levels, religious leaders who have to identify the message to pass on so to end violence for this these leaders have to know each other and that's an invitation you have the second you mentioned the second level the united nations who have to reflect upon the message and have to con the message they they have to convey so a new t new age may start. Each state must reflect on how to respond to this message and what are the measures to be taken. And the third level is the social, the civil society, each of us and all together. I would like to finish by using your word, courage. We have to show courage. Thank you very much.